Good evening. Hi, Jim. I tried getting in earlier and I don't know if no one was here or if, or I suspect it was putting me in the wrong place. <laughs> so I backed out and came in again. Hi, Brother Jim. We, I just got out of Brother Dennis's class. We were running a little bit late, so I just hopped over. Good. How are both of you doing? Good. I emailed my, my term to you uh, without the very last question. So I'll have to I'll have to finish that last number twenty three. I think it okay. was. Okay. <laughs> I was, was going to say, are you just refusing to do that last question? No, I just ran out of getting it done on time. I did send mine to you too, brother Jim, and I'm doing yes. well. Yes, I I got that. Hi, Jim. Hello. How are you? I am doing well. I've got somebody here that's just designated Zoom user. Could you tell me who that is? I've got right now, I've got um, Molly, Canva, Diana, Cheryl, and Zoom user, but I don't know who Zoom user is. Ah, okay. There we go. Brother Jim, do you know, is there a version of the Bible where they have the books arranged in chronological order? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, what's it called? I think it's called the Chronological Bible. Okay. And it's edited by, um, oh, what's his name? He's written other things. A number of other things. Uh, right now I'm blank. He wrote um, When Choice Becomes God. Um, right now I'm just blank on the name, but I, I think I think it's called the Chronological Bible. Okay, thank you. I'll do some research into that. And if and I will Send his name to you when it comes to me. Thank you. I mean, I can even tell you, and I'm assuming it's still in print. Hopefully it is still in print. Uh, he's a lawyer. Uh, he has taught at Pepperdine, um, written a number of books. And like I said, right now, I'm just blank on the, Blank on the name. Okay. We may have some others coming in, but um, so this is our final class of the semester. Um, maybe. I don't know if it's mixed emotions or just excitement that it's all over, um, but I have uh, I have somewhat mixed emotions. I have really enjoyed this semester. I love uh, love studying the Word of God, and um, so I always that that's always excitement to me. And um, you have been a very very good group, just an exceptional group. And uh, so I have, uh, I have appreciated, I have appreciated having you, uh, having you in class and um, 
reading your papers and it's been it's been really good. Okay, as I said, this is the final final class in Acts, and in a sense, it I guess we'll say it it ends with a bang. We're going to have um, Paul's defense. We're going to have a, a, an exciting sea adventure. We're going to have his final, uh, finally his arrival in Rome. And um, really, uh, there's just a lot here and it's uh, an exciting story. Okay, we're starting with chapter 26. In 25, well, 25 and before, you have uh, the uh, the Jews have accused Paul. First, he was um, sent to the Roman governor, um, Felix. F Felix wanted a bribe, and so he he just kept Paul in chains as kind of a kind of a uh, favor for the Jews, but also hoping he would get a bribe. But then Felix is taken out as governor and uh, he is followed by Festus. As we saw, Festus is kind of at a loss as to what's going on here. He shows himself to sort of understand, but not really understand the controversy. Uh, he tells Agrippa, the accusations against Paul have to do with something to do with Jewish law and customs. And um, there's this guy by the name of Jesus who's dead, but Paul says he's alive. And uh, um, he appealed to Caesar, so I'm sending him to Caesar, but I really ought to have a letter that explains something about what's going on. And I don't know uh, what, how to explain it. And so um, he's hoping he can get help from Agrippa. This is Agrippa II, who is the grand, great grandson of Herod the Great. So there's a long history here, by the way, biblically. Herod the Great was the one who uh, killed the uh, babies, trying to get, trying to eliminate Jesus as a baby. And um, we've seen in Acts, we've seen a number of his, um, number of his sons. And this is his um, great grandson. So in chapter 25, he and his wife Bernice come in with great pomp. And we pick up with the first verse of 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So Agrippa gives him permission to speak. Paul begins making his defense. Notice it says he made his defense and then he refers to defense. We've seen this before. This is a theme going all the way back to the beginning of uh, Paul's um, arrest. And the word defense keeps, uh, keeps coming up. This is on one level, a defense of Paul, but in another level, what is more important than the defense of Paul is it's a defense of uh, Christianity. He starts out diplomatically, complimentary, he uh, saying that he, he's, he's glad to be making this defense before Agrippa because he knows that Agrippa is familiar with the customs and controversies of the Jews. Um, of course, Agrippa would be, those are the people over, over which he's ruling. And at the same time, he was finishing the uh, temple renovation that had been started by his great grandfather, Herod the Great. So Paul asks him to listen patiently. Verse four, my manner of life from my youth 
spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is well known to all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for the, the hope, I am accused by the Jews, O, o King. Why is it thought incredible that by any of you that God raises the dead? So he says that from his youth, he has been a dedicated, uh, dedicated Jew. That um, and so he's disarming the whole idea that he, somehow he's uh, attacking Judaism or trying to tear it down or whatever. He says from the very beginning, he was uh, uh, he he was raised as a Jew and he was a practicing Jew and not just any Jew. But he he lived according to the strictest party of our religion, the Pharisees, and Jews universally would have agreed with that. Well, except maybe the Essenes, who thought they were superior to everybody else. Uh, but the but but the Pharisees among the people, among the Jewish people in general, the Pharisees were seen as the most strict, law keeping straight as an arrow kind of people. And they were respected. The Sadducees who were the priestly class in Jerusalem, not the priests in general, but the, but the elite group in Jerusalem, they were not respected by the people, but the Pharisees who were out among the people who were not priests, but laymen were highly respected. And so, um, Agrippa would be familiar with all this. And he and Paul refers to the hope in the promise that God made to our fathers. He speaks of the 12 tribes. Uh, they earnestly worship night and day, he says, uh, in light of this hope. And um, this would this would be well known to, to Agrippa. And as Paul goes on, he's going to show that Christianity is the natural outgrowth of Judaism because it is because it is Christianity um, founded as it is in the in the life and death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, it, it is uh, the natural outgrowth of Judaism and the promises that were made. It, it is, he, he is saying that he is doing nothing more or less than proclaiming the fulfillment of the hope, this, this hope of, uh, in the promise that God had made to them through the prophets. He mentions for the first time, he's going to come back to this, the idea of God raising the dead. Pharisees believed in that. Sadducees did not. But um, he says we shouldn't see that incredible that God raises the dead. I mean, after all, confession of Judaism is that God is the all-powerful creator of the universe. He can do what he wants to. So raising the dead is no, no chore for him. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem, not only locking up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. 
we uh, Paul is talking about a lot of things here that we don't find recorded anywhere else. Um, he, I mean, it is recorded. We, we were aware that he was opposed to uh, Christianity. He saw he saw Jesus as a as an imposter. Um, and so he was for not only was he a committed, fervent Pharisee, Pharisaic Jew, but uh, because of that, he was a firm persecutor of the church because he saw them as heretics, as false teachers. So he worked against them. He locked, he locked up the followers of Jesus in prison. Uh, he received authority uh, after he had received authority from the chief priest. Um, when they when they were put to death, he voted. He voted for the death penalty for them. Uh, he went from synagogue to synagogue, uh, persecuting them and uh, tr trying to make them blaspheme. This would be blaspheming the name of Jesus, uh, denying who he was. He talks about how in fury he even went to foreign cities, and then he's about to speak of Damascus. So there were other foreign cities that he went to besides Damascus. We're familiar with Damascus because of the conversion, but he had apparently uh, gone to other foreign cities as well in pursuit of Christians. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the high priest of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen to the things in which you have seen in me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your, your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he speaks of the appearance on the Damascus Road. He's going to Damascus to find more Christians to persecute. About noonday, a, a, a light from, comes down from heaven. It's brighter than the sun. Um, Paul and his companions fall to the ground. Uh, Saul hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, he knows this is a heavenly vision, but he doesn't know who this is. Um, why are you persecuting me? And then there's this line, which has often puzzled people. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. A goad was a way of uh, getting cattle to do what you wanted to, kind of a point, pointed stick uh, to, to urge them on to uh, do what you wanted. And I think when he says this, he could mean one of two things. One possibility is that Paul's conscience was bothering him. And this is saying it's hard for you to, it's hard for you to work against your own conscience, isn't it? And it could be going all the way back to Stephen and watching Stephen being stoned to death and how Stephen reacted to that. It could be that it was his conscience working on him. I think it is more likely the second, there's a second possibility because in the ancient world, um, the, the, this, became, this idea became proverbial. 
and it could mean conscience. But another possibility here would be not uh, conscience, but destiny. It's hard for you to kick against the goads, then would mean it's hard for you to work against your own destiny. You are destined, Jesus is saying in this uh, interpretation, you are working against the destiny to be my witness. And it's hard. So, so Saul says, who are you? Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Uh, one thing I want you to notice, I think we've noted this before in the past, because this is the third account of Paul's conversion that we have in Acts. The first was just the straight account. And then twice more, um, Paul recounts his own conversion. So this is the, the third one. And um, and it's just significant to me and fits in a bigger pattern that we've talked about when he says, why are you, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And then he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Well, if you had asked Paul, are you persecuting Jesus Christ? I think he would have said, no, I'm, I am persecuting his deceived people. But Jesus so identifies with his people that what you do to his people is what you do to him. And we've seen this identification before. What Jesus is in Luke, the church is and is becoming in Acts. So there is this vision, and in the vision, Paul is given his commission. Jesus says, rise, stand on your feet. I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness. So you're going to be my man, and you are going to be my, you're going to be my servant, and you're also going to be uh, my witness. And remember, witness is one of the key terms. Going all the way back to chapter 1, verse 8, you'll be my witnesses. And throughout Acts, we have uh, the church, especially the apostles. But virtually every major character in Acts is described as a witness, Christian character, is described as a witness. And um, so Paul here is picking up that theme. Uh, he's told he's going to be a, a, a witness to him and that God is going to deliver Paul from the Gentiles. Uh, to and from the Jews, um, but he's going specifically. He's being sent to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they'll turn from darkness to light and from the power of God or the power of Satan to God, so that they'll receive forgiveness of sins and be and find a place uh, among those who are san sanctified or made holy or set apart for for me by faith. And of course, this is a whole series of themes that we've seen. One of the things that I want you to note here is the idea of light. When, when Paul is on the road to Damascus, there is this light, we're told, verse 13. There's this light that's brighter than the sun. And then, and that's a literal light. But then after that, it's used as a, uh, it's symbolic. Uh, the light that blinded him is a light that he's going to proclaim to the Gentiles so that they will turn from darkness to light. Picking up with 19, therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. On this, to this day, I have um, had help that comes from God. And so I stand testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass that the Christ must suffer 
and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So Paul says he wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. He proclaimed the message. He proclaimed the message to the Jews. He proclaimed the message to the Gentiles. This is why he was seized. But he, sa but he says, God has taken care of me. And we're going to see that is going to continue through the rest of the book. God is taking care of him. Um, and he says that in this proclamation that he made, that he's not saying anything, that, uh, that the prophets and Moses, anything but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. So again, we see this. Christianity is the natural outgrowth, of, uh, naturally grows out of Judaism. Um, Judaism points to Christianity. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the whole essence uh, of his argument, that the prophets, that Moses and the prophets proclaimed this the the coming messiah and the kingdom of the messiah they pro, uh, proclaim the very things that have taken place and that christianity rather than being some sort of um, false religion or different religion is um is the, is the fulfillment of the promise that was made to the 12 tribes um Uh, and he, he identifies certain specifics in this message that come from the prophets and Moses, that Christ must suffer, and he would be the first to rise from the dead. And when he says being the first to rise from the dead, it's, it's not the same as saying he's the first one who was ever raised, because Lazarus was raised, but the idea is he's the first in priority and in line in him, we have the hope of resurrection and that he is the beginning of the line of those who will be raised. And again, notice he proclaims light to our people and to the Gentiles. So we have this theme of light once again. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus with a loud voice, said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become as I am, except for these chains. So the Roman, Festus, interrupts uh, Paul's defense because it you know think about something from somebody from a Roman point of view this all the, the, all this business about the hope of Israel and fulfilling these promises Festus doesn't know anything about this except what Paul has just said he doesn't he doesn't have any background and it sounds crazy this is crazy talk in Festus's mind Obviously, Paul is a man of great learning. He grants him that, but it's is very it's is great learning that's driving him bonkers. So he just thinks Paul's going crazy. Uh, all this stuff about, I mean, here we're coming back to to Jesus who's dead and Paul saying he's alive, and um, all this fulfillment of 
of stuff having to Judaism would, doesn't make sense. But Paul then, because these words really haven't been directed to Festus so much as to Agrippa. And so Paul takes the focus back to Agrippa and he says, my words are true and they're rational. This isn't crazy stuff. This isn't just an emotional outburst on my part. These words are true and rational. And the king knows, understands these things. He's banking on Agrippa, knowing what the prophet said, knowing what the hope is. And um, he says he's persuaded that the, this hasn't escaped Agrippa's notice. He, he believes that um, Agrippa knows what the prophet said and believes it. Now Agrippa comes in at this point and says, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Agrippa does know, but he's not willing, he's not willing to commit. And uh, Paul says, whether it's a short time or a long time, I would that you and, er and everyone who hears me would be the same as I am, a Christian, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn they, drawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. The very fact that Paul appealed to Caesar meant, well, as Festus has said, you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. The, the wheels of justice, the uh, of the Roman system had kicked into gear now. And since Paul has made his appeal as a Roman citizen, um, he has a right, but now at, at this point, the necessity of going to Caesar. But this is not a tragedy because this is exactly where God wants him to be going to Rome. Picking up now with chapter 27 and a exciting sea adventure. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adoramatium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we sailed along uh, across the open sea, along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra of Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at uh, Synodus as the wind did not allow us to go further. We sailed under the lee of Crete and Salmone, coasting along, um, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens near which uh, was the city of uh, um, Lycia. Since much, well, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Now, I, I, I would encourage you to um, 
Um, I probably should have come up with a, a, a diagram or a picture of this, but I would encourage you to look at, um, if you can, to look at a map. But if you can imagine the, just imagine the, the Mediterranean Sea, they've started out in um, the eastern end of the Mediterranean in modern day Palestine. They stopped in Sidon, which is along the course, coast, Tyre and Sidon, Phoenician, a Phoenician area, Gentile area. They stopped there. Then they made their way up the coast of, um, um, of Palestine and, uh, and, and um, along the coast of Asia, this is the province, Roman province of Asia, it would be modern day Turkey. So that um, th they sail between Turkey and Cyprus and the island of Cyprus. So that they sail along there. And then after making making a, a stop and finding another ship from Alexandria. This would be Alexandria, Egypt. Um, the, the Centurion finds this ship. It's sailing for Italy. That's where they want to go. So he puts us on board. Um, then, um, then they come to um, they come to Crete. So they've gone they've gone along the coast, and now they've veered somewhat to the uh, to the southwest and they've come to Crete talks about them um, stopping at Fair Havens um, this this was on the southern southern coast um, southern coast of Crete okay and we pick up there since so much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because of because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, "Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives." But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable for spending the winter in, the, the majority decided to put out to sea. And from there on, the, um, the chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Okay, so remember they're in Crete, Fair Havens. Um, it says that um, it gives us an identifier that even the feast is already over. The feast that they're talking about is the is the Day of Atonement, which um, took place in September October. The uh, Mediterranean Sea became very dangerous for sailing in the winter months. And so basically after September, October, November, after November, there was no more sailing on the sea. It was just too dangerous until some, sometime in March. Uh, so, so there's a period of time here where you don't sail. They've already they've already set sail. They've gotten part of the way to Italy, but it's too dangerous. Uh, it's too dangerous to go all the way, so they're finding some place to spend the winter. Fair Havens apparently is not a good place to do this. Paul says this is too dangerous to go on, but the centurion and it makes sense. Uh, who's Paul? Paul is a traveler, but how much does he know about the Mediterranean and the and the weather in the Mediterranean? So the centurion, who's in charge of the prisoners, 
uh, listens to the pilot and to the owner of the ship. And they think that they can go on a little farther and they, there's a better uh, around, as they go around on Crete to the, uh, to the other end, there's a harbor there that ha has an entrance that faces both Southwest and Northwest. And this would be a good place to winter. So there's a gentle, well, we'll pick up there, the gentle breeze, starting with verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called a northeaster uh, struck, uh, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along, running with the lee of a small island, running under the lee of a small island called uh, Cadia. Cadia. Uh, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground at Citrus, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with all their hands, with their own hands, rather. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. Okay, they have a gentle breeze. They think this is what we're looking for, but before they can get to uh, Phoenix, this uh, Northeaster comes down, sweeping down from the, sweeping down from the, the island, and um, they, are, they're, they are driven well off course by this tempestuous wind, and they're driven along. Um, they and if and if you look at what they do here, this does show Luke's understanding of naval practices, nautical practices uh, of his day, and um, because they're in such a dangerous situation, they're lightening the ship by throwing cargo overboard. They even get to a place where they throw the tackle, which is um, ropes and um, pulleys and things overboard. They're throwing everything overboard to lighten the ship. And, um, but they're basically just giving her their, uh, her head and, and letting her go in the wind because they can't, they can't fight against the wind. And um, the, the, they don't see the sun or the stars for many days. And the tempest just continues. I mean, this is a time when they shouldn't be out on the, on the ocean at all. And uh, all hope of being saved um, is abandoned. Hey, Jim, this yes. is Molly. Um, Backing up a bit, just to bring in a personal note in the early part of chapter 27. Um, I've read somewhere where, I mean, obviously Paul is a prisoner. And so yes. he can't just take anybody with him, anybody or several anybody's with him as guests on this prison ship this prisoner ship. I mean, it's basically been turned into a prisoner ship with, you know, wheat and whatever they're taking to, to Italy. But um, I, I heard somewhere where uh, Luke's accompanying Paul probably indicated that he had to declare himself Paul's slave and that a symbol of slavery was when they uh, nailed a peg in your ear. And that was, did, have you heard this story? <laughs> I 
Have you heard this? Story? I've heard it, but not in connection with this. Oh, what did you hear it in connection with? The song. But I yeah. heard it was in connection with this very thing that uh, Luke probably had to indicate he was Paul's slave to be able to go with him. And that he probably had the peg, uh, you know, forced through his ear uh, as a symbol that he was Paul's slave. If that is the case, I'm wondering about Aristarchus. What was his role in all this? Because it seems to me that it's Luke and Paul. And then all of a sudden he says, and we were accompanied by Aristarchus, the Macedonian. What, what do you know about that? Um, just, just what the text says, which isn't too much. Um, what you're saying about Luke could be could be the case, but I'm not I'm not, I'm not sure that it is. I think there's some other things going on here. We do know that the throughout Luke and Acts, um, I'm, I'm going to connect this throughout Luke and Acts. Centurions are seen in a positive light in a general way or seen in a positive light. And Julius, who's in command of the detachment of soldiers who are looking after the prisoners, um, has a soft spot or a warm spot in his heart for Paul. We see him being protective of Paul and giving Paul's kind of special permission to do things. So um, I, I think it's at least possible that Luke and or Aristarchus are um, Paul's just been given permission. One possibility would be he's given permission um, to to uh, let these people accompany him. That would be unusual, but um, letting Paul go on shore and not killing the prisoners and all that sort of thing is a bit unusual too. Uh, so so it's possible. I, it is also possible that for whatever reasons, uh, both of them were uh, being imprisoned as well. That seems less likely to me, but it's just not clear. So it could be any of that. All we know is they were accompanying Paul, but don't have a, we don't have a definitive answer for, for why they were allowed to accompany him. So I don't have any more insight than that. Comment? Well, uh, it, 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 the way it's worded would not indicate that Luke and Aristarchus were prisoners because it says in verse one, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners. And then it says, and we set sail and we were accompanied by Aristarchus. I guess if you, I mean, it doesn't appear that they were prisoners, but well, I, I think it's more likely that, uh, as I said, I think it's more likely that they were simply given given permission to accompany them. Um, in in as in a, in a sense, yes, these had become prison ships. But if you notice, and we I, I referred to this once before when during uh, Paul's missionary journeys, and I think we see it here. I mean, we're used to, okay, we're in one place. In this case, we're in Palestine and we want to go to, to Rome. And so we, we, we book, a, book a flight or book a ship that's going to Rome. But uh, ancient world was different. There were no travel agencies. And um, so we, we see him... We, we see Julius taking one ship and then stopping and finding another one that's going to where they want to go. 
so they're moving from ship to ship not it's they're not just booking a booking a cruise ship to go where they want to go and so this this is a ship the alexandrian ship that they're on now was one that was already going to italy they weren't going to italy because of the because of the roman prisoners they had cargo which they've now lost but they had cargo that, and they were on their way to Italy with a cargo and um, and um, Julius worked out some kind of deal with them to for them to accompany them. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's more likely that they were simply allowed to accompany Paul for some reason. I, I threw out the the idea of they're also being prisoners in some sense. I, I, I threw that out as a possibility, but I, I personally, I think the strongest possibility is they were simply allowed to accompany him. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Picking up with 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, uh, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I, I have faith in God. That is exactly as I have been told. That it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must uh, but we must run aground on some island. Um, sure, sounds like Paul's saying, I told you so, but there is something more going on there. In a sense, he is telling him, I told you so, but it, it functions in a, uh, another way. He's reminding them that if they'd listened to him the first time, they wouldn't have gotten into this situation. And that should have a way of assuring them that um, that what he says this time will be accurate. And this time he's actually saying an angel appeared to him and told him this. But and he didn't claim anything like that the, the first time, but he was right. And so I think it functions in that way. He urge, he he urges them to eat something. Um, no, he's not urging them to eat anything yet. That, that comes a little, little farther on. We'll come back to that. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven ac across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the elders or the uh, sailors suspected that they were nearing the land. So they, so they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took another sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes and, and, and the ship's boats, boat and, and uh, of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day. Uh, 
that you have continued um, in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair on your, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and gave, uh, and, and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged, and some of, and ate some of the food themselves. We were about 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when, uh, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a, a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. And at the same time, loosening the ropes th that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail, foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they, they ran the vessel aground. The bow st stuck and remained immovable and the stern was being broken up by the surf. And the soldiers plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. <clears throat> he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of wood, uh, pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Okay, uh, they're being driven along. The, the How desperate the sailors are is seen by the fact that they're ready to abandon the ship and go out in the, in the lifeboat, which would be more dangerous than being in the ship, except they're sure that the ship's doomed. Paul tells the centurion and the soldiers that the sailors need to stay with the ship or they're going to they'll all perish and so the the sailors cut away the ropes for the lifeboat and let it go then paul encourages them by saying they need to have something to eat they haven't been eating anything but they're going to need their strength for about what for what's about to happen he encourages them to take food it's interesting then that he says when he said these things he took bread giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and, and began to eat. That bread, giving thanks, breaking it, and eating is a pattern that we, that we see in Luke and Acts. Sometimes it has to do with um, regular meals, but it was also used in connection with the Lord's Supper. I don't believe this is the Lord's Supper, but I do think there's a, a kind of an allusion to, you might say, a fellowship meal uh, and maybe just a reminder that God, uh, that God's in control. Um, but they eat. Then, um, then when it's day, they don't recognize where they are, but they plan to run the ship ashore. They don't make it. They get stuck. Uh, they get stuck going in. The ship's being battered to pieces. The soldiers are going to kill the prisoners. The reason being, this isn't just some kind of cruelty. If any of the prisoners escape, the soldiers will <coughs> forfeit their lives. So the idea is you, you kill them so they won't escape. Um, but the centurion wants to save Paul. And so he, uh, he prevents his soldiers from killing, <coughs> from killing the prisoners. Uh, he orders, because the, the boat's being battered to pieces, he orders those who, are, who can swim to jump overboard into the sea and swim for land. And the ones who can't swim to take planks of wood or pieces of the ship 
and um, and use those to get to land. <coughs> I'm going to take a drink and then, then we'll begin with uh, chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And this is just to the south of of Italy. The native people showed us unusual kindness. By the word, way, the, the word for unusual kindness is the word from which we get philanthropy. Um, it has to do with showing love, kindness for other people. Anyway, the people, the native people showed them unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and, fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and had put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging on his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or to suddenly fall down dead. <clears throat> but, when he, but when they waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Notice how quickly, when people are looking for signs, look, notice how quickly it can change from one thing to another. Being pagans, they they believed in signs, and the, the whole idea was this guy must be a murderer because he escaped from the sea, and that's no small thing, but justice got him. So he must be a bad guy because of this viper that that fastened on his hand, but he shook off the viper viper into the fire and didn't have any ill effect and so they moved from he must be a murderer and the gods have gotten him to he must be one of the gods now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius Publius who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days it happened that the father of Publius uh, lay sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when, he had, uh, when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. <clears throat> okay, the the governor of the island, his father was sick with fever and dysentery. Paul heals him. And so they bring other people to be, to be healed. Um, after three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria. And the twin gods as a, a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at uh, Regima. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we made Putty Oli. Um, there we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, whom, um, when they he heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. 
On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, Paul allowed, was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Okay, so they finally arrive in Italy. Uh, some brothers there find, uh, from, from Rome uh, hear that he's there and they come out to three taverns to meet us. That was about 30 miles from Rome. And um, I mean, in their day, that's a fair, fair journey. Um, then continuing, after three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when, he, uh, and when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I am delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem to the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they, uh, they, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak to you since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken evil about you. But we desire to hear what you, to hear from you what views you, uh, what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had, so he meets with Jewish leaders. He has, and we're, we'll come back to that. <clears throat> He's allowed to stay in a, a house by himself, guarded. Um, as we'll see a little later, it's basically house arrest. Um, and we see he has a certain amount of freedom, but not total, but he can receive, he can receive people and the local Jewish leaders uh, come to him. Uh, they have not heard anything about him or anything with what he's been charged, but they do know that the, the sect, Christianity, has been spoken against, but they're interested in hearing what he has to say. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's hearts are grown dull and their ears, and with their ears, they can hardly hear. And, and their eyes, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Okay, the Jews come, there, there's a controversy among them. He convinces some of them, but some of them are opposed to everything that he's saying. Um, they have this disagreement among themselves, uh, but they depart after he confronts the, the unbelief. He says the Holy Spirit's right, and, and he uh, refers to this passage. He quotes this passage from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. If you go back to Isaiah and see the commission Isaiah was given as prophet, in Isaiah 6, it's got to be about the most discouraging 
from a human standpoint, discouraging mission. He's given this commission to go and talk to him, but they're not going to listen to you. And, uh, he, and Isaiah asks, how long am I supposed to do this? And God says, until all the cities lie in ruins. <clears throat> so the ministry isn't exactly a um, one that, from a human standpoint, would be seen as a great success. People aren't going to listen. And Paul says, just like the people back there who wouldn't listen. So you're acting in the same way. Therefore, verse 28, let it be known to you that this salvation that God has sent, to, uh, th this let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. It's been offered to, to these Jews, but the Jews have rejected. Now, that's not to say that no Jews will accept. That would be going beyond what this is actually saying. But it is saying that many Jews through the centuries have hardened their hearts against it, uh, against the message, and that they simply cannot wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of Israel and of Moses and the prophets. The evidence is there that he, he, he was the promised Messiah. He didn't. He's not a pretender. He's not a deceiver. He, he's not a false teacher. He, he, was, he was the one for whom the devout people of Israel have always been looking. And then the book ends with he, that is Paul, he lived there two whole years at his own expense, i.e. in house arrest and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So for two whole years, he lives at his own expense. He, say, he is at liberty to welcome those who come to him. But the implication is he's not at liberty to go out and wander around the marketplaces and go other places, but he can welcome those who come to him. And he uses that as an opportunity to proclaim, notice, to proclaim the kingdom of God and, and, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are, both of these have to do with the fulfillment of the hopes and dreams and the, the, the promises that were made to Israel uh, for the uh, coming Messiah. And when you go to the prophets. And one of the things that struck me about Luke and Acts, Luke ends with Jesus, remember, opening his disciples' minds to what the Old Testament said about him. The Hebrew scriptures, there are specific Hebrew scriptures that we could go to, such as Isaiah 53. There are very specific ones that we could go to, but in another sense, all of the Old Testament points leads us to Jesus, not in the same way as, as the, the prophetic passages, which sp speak specifically of the kingdom, the coming kingdom, and of the coming Messiah. But in a sense, all the Old Testament leads up to Jesus and is a foreshadowing of who he is and what he comes to do. And so Paul is proclaiming the kingdom of God. And this is the kingdom of God that was promised throughout the Old Testament, this coming, coming kingdom and uh, of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, who is king over, over the kingdom. Um, One thing I want you to notice, and we've seen this throughout the book, but I'll mention one, one last thing here. You will notice that when Paul's on trial, there is subtly a parallel. There are parallels that appear between his trials and the trial of Jesus. What I mean by that is, for instance, Paul appears before the Romans. 
in his case, it's Felix and Festus, but Roman, Roman governors, Jesus appeared before Pilate. And in Luke, Luke is the only one that mentions this, Pilate sends J Jesus to Herod, to a, a former Herod, um, who was who wanted to meet him because he'd heard a lot about him and he wanted him to he wanted him to show me a miracle. Um, so he appears before the Romans and he appears before uh, Herod. Um, he is and, and Paul Paul is tried before the Romans and he appears before uh, Agrippa the second. In both cases, their, their condemnation or their trials uh, were because of the hope of Israel. Jesus was the Messiah. Paul was proclaiming the Messiah. So we've seen this throughout the book that, that what, who Jesus was in Luke is what the church is and is becoming in Acts. One last thing, because people always have this, it seems like this in mind. It seems odd to us that um, that X ends the way it does. I mean, there are some reasonable questions. Okay, for two whole years, he, uh, he lives at his own expense at house arrest, and he proclaims the kingdom of God and the teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Without hindrance. He's a prisoner, but the but as he says in one of his letters, but the uh, but the word of God is not chained. I may be chained, but the word of God is not chained. So why is it in this way? I mean it would end a reasonable question would be so what what next? Does he die? Does he get out? What happens next? X doesn't say. And I, 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 um, I don't agree with William Barclay about everything. He's weak on miracles, for instance. But, um, but I think his comment on why X ends the way it does, I think, I think is just perfect. He said, X ends the way it, way it does because the, the story's over. There's no, it doesn't matter any of these other questions we've got about what happened next are not important to the story that Acts is telling. Acts began in Jerusalem and it's ended in, well, I'll add, it began in, in Jerusalem, the center of Judaism, and it's ended in Rome, the center of the Roman Empire. And if you remember back to Acts 1 8 again, Jesus said, You're going to be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And uh, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the whole book can be outlined, three point outline along those lines. <clears throat> it starts in Jerusalem, it goes through Judea and Samaria, which is a larger area around Jerusalem. And it and it, then it ends up being expanded to the to the ends of the earth, and in the way that that's being used, Rome is the ends of the earth. It's it's expanded through the entire um, Roman Empire, and it also the way Acts ends, it also leaves us with the sense that we can put ourselves into the picture. It ends with Paul preaching boldly and preaching the word of God boldly and without hindrance. And it leaves us with the question, how about you? Are you going to proclaim the message boldly and without hindrance? Um, you're not imprisoned. What's your excuse? Um, so anyway, it's a, I think it is an exciting book and it's a challenging book because I think that theme of 
<clears throat> this is who Jesus is, and this is what we're to be as the disciples of Jesus, both as individuals and as at, corporately as, as the church. Okay, let's have a prayer together, and then if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, I'll be happy to address those. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have had together in your book. We thank you for the example of Jesus and the example of the early church as they live out the teachings of Jesus and as they model the teachings of Jesus in their own lives. Father, we ask that you would help us to be faithful disciples, to be faithful in proclaiming your word, in being your people, in becoming more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this uh, semester. This, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it and hope you have, uh, hope you've benefited from it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Brother Jim. It's great, it's been great time. Great. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Great class. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. class. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yes, enjoyed the class very much. Good. I love I love the I love all the personal notes, whether they're actual or not. But um, I love the idea that he writes the Ephesians, one of the prison epistles that he wrote from that two year stay with that soldier guarding him all the time. And then in Ephesians, he gives a real direct comparison of the putting on the whole armor of God. I think he he saw that soldier all day long, 24-7, and uh, he came up with uh, some great teaching for us based on that soldier's armor. <laughs> yes, good, good observation. I also think that I wonder if... Um, I wonder if the, some of those soldiers who were chained to him wondered who the prisoner was. <laughs> yeah, and in in what which book does he say that he preached uh, to the whole Praetorian Guard? It's one yes. of the epistles. So, you know, uh, does it say that the, any of them became Christian? I don't. I don't remember the wording of that. Well, he speaks of. Um, you're talking about Philippians one. And I, I, uh, I want to check my check to make sure my memory is not off. I, I, I think he, I think he does refer to it, or he at least alludes to, um, to it about about it spreading through the Praetorian Guard. So I, I think I think there is an implication that some of them became Christians. Um, You know, Jim, uh, another thing while you're looking at that, a great study, um, I think, would be a walk through, uh, once we get into Paul's journeys, uh, attaching the particular location with a, the particular book that he wrote. Yeah. Like when, you know, he, he wrote... Uh, uh, when he was in Corinth, where was he when he wrote Romans? And, you know, it's there that he indicates, you know, that he wants to go on to Spain. Uh, yeah, it, like that. I, I just think that would be such a wonderful study if somebody, does it exist? Has someone put those things together? I'm sure, I'm sure offhand, I don't know, but I'm sure that someone has. And it's, um, I'm trying to think if I know anybody that did. It's not, not coming to mind, but, um, and of course, part of, part of our issue is not knowing, not always knowing specifically where he was when he, when he wrote some of them. Yeah. Well, um, I, yeah. I believe, for instance, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that Philippians and therefore um, 
I would say Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon, uh, I think were written from Rome. Right. Uh, um, but there are some who believe that, uh, yeah. yeah, they speak of an, an Ephesians mm -hmm. imprisonment and they think he was there, but I, I don't, I don't think that fits. And the whole thing about the ESV says Imperial Guard, NIV says uh, Praetorian Guard. Um, well, wh whichever way you translate that, we're talking about we're talking about people who are tasked with, as I understand it, with uh, protecting the emperor. Well, that's not going to be Ephesus. And by the way, yeah, Philippians 1, verses 12 and 13, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, it doesn't say specifically that, that they became Christians, but it seems to be implied that at least some of them did. But yeah, And we do know, I love the story, it comes from, it comes from the second century that there was a group of Roman soldiers who were out in the frontier, Europe, the Germanic frontier, and um, and this whole whole unit of of soldiers converted to Christianity. Uh, well, this is at a time when when Christians were being persecuted by the empire, and um, so they ordered these soldiers out onto the ice to stay there until they died of the cold. Hmm. And um, they, uh, they sang a song. They chanted a song about being soldiers for Christ and the numbers, and they kept, they kept singing it until there were none left. Hmm. Um, so there, there was, you know, there were some pretty dramatic stories of conversion and of sacrifice because of the conversion that, that come down to us fr from the Bible and from, from church history as well. And um, it, it goes, it goes beyond some of the specifics we have, like I said, uh, I could I could see somebody writing a whole novel about about mm -hmm. Paul the the non Christian mm -hmm. and what he was doing in those synagogues and what he was doing. Uh, I don't have any idea what foreign cities he would have been going to, but he says he did. Besides and, Damascus. And tonight is the first time that I took note of those two words he described: raging fury. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a lot of violent hatred. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I just uh, I wonder if this South Houston Bible Institute has a study like that that puts the, you know, puts those things, the books that he wrote with the location. I. They can do it for at least some. That's true. It'd be, be a good, be a good study. Be a good study. I mean, you know, just linking, linking Colossians and, and his uh, uh, possible teaching of Epaphras while he was in Ephesus so long, because it says that, I mean, Ephesus is a gateway to Asia and, and he stayed there and he preached to, um, I think, to all Asia. Doesn't it say that? He preached yeah. to all. And, you know, I mean, I just think Epaphras had to have gone and heard him. And, and then went back and, and witnessed himself. Became a Christian and witnessed there in Colossae. That's what I think. 
But anyway. <laughs> I think the screens have frozen, but I appreciate the study. And I'm gonna leave.